Okay, welcome back. In this session, we're gonna look at how do you treat, greet, seat, and then follow up with first time guest. Okay, we probably won't get to all of that in this session, but we're gonna take a pretty good chunk at it, and then we'll spend at least two sessions on first time guest. Now, as we get into today's session, let me just remind you of our key verse for assimilation. It's from 2 Peter 3, 18. It reads, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the truth is, for most people, that process of growing in Jesus Christ, of understanding who Jesus is, it starts when they come to church for the first time. So I don't know if you can remember in your own personal walk with God when you came to church for a first time. But coming to church for the first time can be a very intimidating process. And even if you can't remember coming to church for the first time, you can certainly remember going on vacation and checking into a hotel for the first time. Perhaps you went to a large resort and you walk in there and you're not even sure where to park or where to unload your luggage or where the front desk is. This, is, this can be a very confusing and unsettling experience to go somewhere that you've never been for the first time. Well, when it comes to first time guests, they have the same experience as you have when you go somewhere for the first time. But unfortunately, coming to church is even more intimidating. You know, it's a very intimidating thing for someone who's never been to church to show up at a church for the first time. They don't know where to park. They don't know if they're gonna be welcomed. They don't know if they're gonna like the people. They don't know if they can trust you with their, their children or they don't even know where to enter. And some of you have renovated your sanctuary so much that if they come in what looks like the main door, they actually walk into the choir loft. So this is something we really have to think about, that first time guest experience. And you know, a lot of people will come to church for the first time, but it's a very difficult challenge to get them to return to church for a second time. But here's a startling statistic. People decide whether or not they're coming back to your church within the first seven minutes of arriving. So within the first seven minutes, they're making up their mind, am I going to like this church and am I going to come back? So you have seven minutes to make a good impression. Now there are some things you can do to overcome that if you make a bad impression. So it's not like it's your only chance. God will give you grace and hopefully power even if you mess it up. But we wanna do all that we can in those first seven minutes to make a good impression on our first time guest. And so if you think about it, if you're a teaching pastor or a preaching pastor or the senior pastor, first time guests have probably already made up their mind before you've even delivered the first word of your sermon. And contrary to what you may think, first-time guests often show up early. They're the early arrivers. It's, it's your regular attenders that often show up late. So they show up before the service starts. Maybe they sit in the parking lot for a couple of minutes and watch people go in and out of your building to try to figure out how the flow might work. They might go in and sort of spy on the children's area before they go to check in. They might arrive in the sanctuary when there's just a handful of people. And what are they thinking about? What are they experiencing? What are you putting in their hands? How are you creating that experience? Basically from the parking lot all the way into the church and then once they get back home. Well, that's what we're gonna look at in these sessions. When someone comes to your church for the first time, I want you to focus on four big areas. And so this session and the next session will be broken down into these four big areas. I, the first area that we're gonna look at is what I call pre-service pre-service. This is the focus that I want you to have in your church before the service even starts. So you can kind of think of the pre-service area as the area of first contact. It's the, it's the time they arrive into your parking lot and they make it all the way into the pew. Or the way I like to think of that is from the street to the seat. So before the service even starts, you've got to get them from the street into the seat. Now, let me just put you in the mind of someone coming to church for the first time. So maybe you can think of someone who recently was a guest at your church. I, I almost said a visitor at your church. I, I'd have been cursing at you here in our second session. But think of someone who recently was a guest at your church for the first time. If you know them, maybe you can literally visualize them. Let, let's just take a family who lives down the street. Maybe it's a mom and a dad and they've got one or two children. Or maybe more likely it's a mom and a stepdad and it's a mixed family and he has a child from the first marriage and they have a child together. But whatever the situation might be, on Saturday night, 
that family makes a bold decision to say, we're going to go to church tomorrow. And the kids say, church? What does that even mean? What time will we have to get up? We're going to miss Sunday morning television. Maybe dad's even a little reluctant, or maybe mom's a little reluctant. But somehow or another, this family makes a courageous decision, I would say led by the Spirit, Probably God is already working in their life through some tension, transition, or trouble that they're going through. And for the first time in a long time, or maybe for the first time since never, they are thinking about going to church. And so now on Sunday morning, they have all of these dreams about what that Sunday morning is going to be like. Maybe dad thinks, I'm going to get up early and cook pancakes for the entire family, and I'm going to make this a great Sunday morning, the best Sunday morning that we've ever had. And mom has dreams about how she's going to dress and how she's going to dress the children and how they're going to make it down to that church. Now, that's going on in the positive side of their mind. On the flip side, they're thinking, I wonder if we'll be welcomed. I wonder if we'll see anybody we know. I wonder if there'll be people like us. I wonder what the children's ministry might be like. I wonder what the, the, the pastor is going to teach on. So they have all of these concerns as well, but even on the best of Sunday mornings, in this particular couple's life, everything is going to go wrong. You see, when someone decides to come to church for the first time, it's almost like they're sort of inviting the enemy to do everything he can to distract them. And so Satan begins to work in that couple's mind. And in, in that home, the alarm clock doesn't go off. The pancakes get burned. The kids spill something on uh, their new outfits. Mom didn't have enough time to get dressed like she would like to get dressed. But in spite of all of that negative things that happen to try to prevent them from coming, let's just imagine somehow or another, that couple gets into the car, they make it out of their driveway, and they arrive onto your church property. Well, at that point, when they pull into your church parking lot, assimilation begins. You, you may not be able to control what happens at home. You may not be able to control whether or not they come to church. Uh, you may be able to in some way, by the way. That's another seminar that I have on, on evangelism. But when they pull into that parking lot, you want to do everything you can to make that the best first seven minutes of their life. So let's talk about that area of first contact or the big area of pre service. So when someone pulls into your parking lot, as they're in the parking lot, as they're making their way into your building, there are four areas of first contact. So four areas of first contact. Here's number one. Number one, how are they going to be greeted? G-R-E-E-T-E-D. How are they going to be greeted? Now, when you think about greeted, and I'll explain why they all start with E-D, you'll see as we go along. But when you think about greeted, you often think about greeters. And I want to talk about greeters and give you some advice on greeters. In fact, in the supplemental resources that you have with the seminar, you can see a basic job description as to what a greeter should do. But there are really two types of greeting that a person coming to your church for the first time would receive. The first is the inanimate greeting of all the inanimate stuff at your church, all the non-human stuff. So for example, your parking lot is a greeter. Your sign is a greeter. Your signage is a greeter. And so what is the physical environment of your church saying to the people who are attending for the first time? I mean, how does your sign look? How, how is the yard maintained? Is the parking lot clean? Are entry points clearly marked in your church. You know, it's very expensive, of course, to keep all of this stuff up to date. If you've got a large parking lot, that can be very expensive just to maintain that. So I'm not talking about perfection. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about excellence. So let me give you my definition of excellence. Excellence is doing the best you can with what you've got. It's doing the best you can with what you've got. You know, maybe you're a church that's been struggling for a long time and the, the parking lot, it needs a lot of repair. But you can do the best you can with what you've got. You can pick up the litter out of the parking lot. You can weed it. You can, re you can spray it and remove all the weeds from the parking lot. You may not be able to repave it or to repaint it, but you can do the best you can with what you've got. You may not be able to afford a lot of expensive landscaping, but you can keep things neat and trim, and volunteers in your church can make that, uh, uh, that lawn or that upkeep around the church, the landscaping, look as good as it possibly can. Well, you see, all of these things 
are greeting people who arrive. And, and your landscaping and your church sign and your parking lot are saying, we've been expecting you. We want to put our best foot forward. You're welcome here at our church. Or it's been saying, go away. <laughs> we don't care. We're outdated. We're no longer relevant. And of course, I know which one you want. You want the physical surroundings of your church to put forward the best greeting they possibly can. And the truth is, some simple landscaping, a fresh coat of paint, that can make all the difference in the world. Now, for most of our journey locations, because we're in major metropolitan areas, and we do have locations that are not in, in urban areas, but for most of our journey locations, we meet in rented facilities. Now, some of our places own their own bu uh, building or have a long-term lease like many of you, but a lot of our churches meet in rented facilities. I remember one time we were meeting in an elementary school, and uh, we couldn't do a whole lot about the broken sidewalk out front of the elementary school. We couldn't do a whole lot about those little toilets that they have in an elementary school. But you know, people knew that we were meeting in an elementary school. They knew we had no control over the sidewalk. They knew we had no control over those little toilets in the bathroom. We were in an elementary school. But here's what we could do. We could do the best we could with what we had. We can do the best we can with what we have. That's my definition of excellence. So we could clean those toilets. We could spray down that elementary school restroom. We could sweep and even mop or spray down the sidewalk out front. We could do the best we could do. And that's really what I'm asking you to do, to put your best foot forward, to do what you can do. If you have money, by all means, this is a great place to invest it. But if you don't, do the best you can with what you have. And the truth is, if you're in a rented facility, you probably get a little more grace from those who attend than if you own your own facilities. Because people know if you own it, if you're there 24 seven, seven days a week, then you should be able to keep it as clean and as well kept as possible. But there is this area of greeted and the physical surroundings, hopefully say to everybody who comes to your church, you're welcome, come on in. We've been expecting you. We wanted to put our best foot forward. Just like I was talking in the last session, if you were coming to my house for dinner, if you were my guest, we would clean up. We would do the best we could. We might sweep some of the toys underneath the couch, but we would at least do the best we could. So that's the physical surroundings when it comes to greeted. Now, another part of the greeted area is your greeters. These are the people, literally, that stand out in front of your church or stand at the door of the church, and they welcome people. I mentioned that I was on staff at a large church in Southern California back many years ago before I started the journey. And uh, in Southern California, it was common to have greeters who would literally hug you in the parking lot. I mean, it was Southern California. They were a hugging crowd out in Southern California. But when I moved to New York City, I, I knew that it probably would not be wise to have greeters that would hug you. New Yorkers think if you're going for a hug, you might just be going for their wallet, and they're a little uncertain about that. So I had to really adapt this to my culture. And, and I want to encourage you to adapt this to your culture. You know, more and more people today, they don't like to shake hands. But the first thing that we think about when it comes to a greeter is that you offer to shake somebody's hands. Well, more and more people are germophobic, and there's some very well-known celebrities and folks who don't like to shake hands. Well, a lot of people are like that. More people in America are introverts than they are extroverts. I don't know necessarily outside of America, but I imagine this is true for many Western civilizations. And then depending on your culture, wherever you are, you have to adapt this. So what does a friendly greeting mean for you? You know, if you're in an Asian culture, that means something very different than if you're in a Latino culture or if you're in an Anglo culture. So you've got to adapt this. So, but I want you to think about it. How can we put our best greeters out in front of our church, and then what kind of greeting do we want our greeters to give? You know, we've learned at the journey, especially in New York City, that perhaps just a wave and a welcome is enough. Welcome to the journey. Come on in. Now we often do welcome to the journey with one greeter, and we have a little candy basket for another greeter, and I'll tell you where I got that idea a little bit later. But we want to welcome people. I, I want to put friendly people out front. <laughs> have you ever noticed that Sometimes if you ask people to volunteer to be greeters, it's only the unfriendly people who volunteer. Now, now why is that? Well, you want people who can smile. In fact, I, I really want at minimum two things from my greeters. I want my greeters to be able to smile 
And many times on Sunday, we do smile practice with our greeters. I want them to smile, and if possible, I want them to have all their teeth. Okay, so that might be a little harder to find, but that's really, uh, at minimum, what I want. But I want them to be friendly. I want them to be knowledgeable in at least the basics of where to go and where would you check in your children, where are the restrooms. These are things people want to know when they come for the first time. We train our greeters every Sunday. When you uh, pull up this job description that we have in the resource area along with this seminar, that list of what a greeter does in their position X number of minutes before the service, smile and say welcome to the journey to every person who attends, stay there and on down the line of the different things we have in our job description. We go over that every single Sunday. And the reason why is even if they're the most dedicated greeters, they forget. They forget what their job is. You know, even if they serve the previous week, a whole week in their life has happened. They've been at work. They've been engaged in other things. So we want to give a friendly, upbeat reminder every week of what a greeter is supposed to do. And then, yes, we do allow people to be volunteer greeters, but we're careful about who we put out front. Our most visible greeters are the ones that put the best foot forward. If we have someone that maybe we're unsure about, we might ask them to serve at a resource table or ask them to serve as a directional person. We want to make our ushers and our greeters, and that's really what we uh, put in this area, ushers and greeters, we want to make them the best that we can. And your ushers and greeters, they want to do a good job for you, but maybe you have to take a little time to train them. So think about your greeters, your physical greeters, and then also the physical surroundings, and all of that goes into this first area of first contact called greeted. But then there's a second area of first contact, and that is directed. Directed. First-time guests want to be directed as to where they should go and where they need to go. So direction is very important. To, To back up for just a bit, think about the last time you were lost. Maybe you were driving a car, maybe you were on a business trip or perhaps on vacation or maybe just even on a a different side of town than you normally find yourself. How did it feel to be directionally lost? We could talk about being spiritually lost. I understand that's the business that we're in. But just for a moment, think about what it means to be directionally lost. Now, now today, you know, we rarely ever are. We've all got GPSs and we've got all these gadgets and everything that, that help us out. But, you know, before we had all of that, I was rarely ever lost. You see, I'm a guy and guys, we don't believe we're lost until we're out of gas. Okay, so we're fine. We'll just keep driving around. But if you ever remember that unsettling feeling of not knowing your way around, or maybe you're a hiker and you've been lost in the woods before, this can be very unsettling. This can create a lot of anxiety in your life. Well, when that couple that we were thinking about before, who made that brave decision to come to church, when they pull into your parking lot and they are directionally confused, it raises their already sky-high level of anxiety. And so you want to do everything you can directionally to lower that anxiety. Maybe you have some greeters in the parking lot that tell people where to park. And if you've ever been to Disneyland or Disney World, you know how powerful those parking lot attendants can be to create a great initial impression. But even if you have a a big enough parking lot or it's clear and you don't need physical greeters in the parking lot, you might need some directional signs as to where to park. Parenthetically, let me just say, I'm really not a big fan of people who give assigned parking to first-time guests or even things that some churches do where they say, turn on your blinkers or turn on your lights if you're a first-time guest. I know there will be first-time guests who will use them, and that may be reason enough. But more and more, especially if people are previously unchurched or de-churched or if they haven't been to church for a long time, they really want to remain anonymous. And one of the big fears that your first-time guests have, especially those that have no current relationship with God, is they want to be one of the crowd. They want to be anonymous. So just know if you're using those kind of techniques to try to make it easy for your first-time guest, that really only works for Christians who are already churched that are looking for a new church. But for an unchurched person, they're not going to turn on their lights. They're not going to park in the first-time guest parking lot because they don't know what that might signal to you and what that might do uh, to them to be recognized in that way. So you want good direction, not just the preferred parking, but direction as to where to park and then direction about where to enter. 
you know, just from a very simple standpoint, is it really clear for someone who's never been to your church where they enter? So you want a big sign out front that says, enter here, worship space here, kids check in there, student room here. You may think you have enough directional signs, but here's what I want to challenge you to do. Double it or even triple it. Have signs that are up high, have signs that are down low. Have signs that are on the corners, have people standing to offer directions with lanyards or, or name tags that say, ask me, I'm here to help. You want to direct people as much as you can. This allows for a great first impression. So greeted, directed. And by the way, directional signs and all of that, that's pretty inexpensive to provide. And then here's a third area, treated. How are they greeted, directed, and how are they treated? Now, this is a, a little more of an atmospheric type idea, a, a little more ephemeral, just a little more of a feeling type uh, area than perhaps greeted or directed. I mean, directed, you either have the signs or you don't. Greeted, you've got friendly greeters who smile and you've got good physical surroundings or you don't. But when I talk about treated, I'm really talking about how a guest might feel when they come to your church. Do they get a positive vibe from your church? That sounds like a good Southern California phrase. Do they feel welcome when they come to your church? Are you treating them with respect? And you know, respect starts in the parking lot. Respect starts with the signs. Respect, it means you think about where they are versus where you are. You think about how they feel versus how you feel as a longtime member of the church. But a first time guest wants to be treated with respect and in a way that makes him or her feel like the church is glad that you are there. I don't have this in my notes, but you know the Bible verse, right? Where it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Well, you want people to feel that joy when they walk into your church. But if we're honest, we've all been to churches where it didn't seem like the people were glad that we were there. In fact, I've been to a few churches where I felt like they were sad that they had to be there. And then I kind of felt sad myself. I've been to at least one church I can remember where I almost thought they were mad that I was there. And they're like, who are you? And what are you doing here? And why are you messing up our church? Well, I want to create this warm, friendly, glad environment. Yes, you do that with the parking lot. Yes, you do that with signs. Yes, you do that with smiling faces. But many times it's the little touches. It's the little things that show that you care. And when it comes to assimilation, little things don't mean a lot. They mean everything. Let me give you an example of this. When my wife and I were both in college, somebody gifted us one time with a weekend away. The Ritz-Carlton, which was about four hours from our house, uh, was running a weekend special for $99. And a caring couple said, you guys have worked really hard. You're both in school. They gifted us with a weekend at the Ritz-Carlton. Now, full confession, contrary to how I look and sound, I'm not the normal customer for a Ritz-Carlton. I, I, I tend to stay in much lower brands of hotels, probably like you. But this was a real experience for me. And at that particular time, I'd never been anywhere this ritzy, forgive the pun. But we arrive at the Ritz-Carlton. Just to tell you the story, I was in graduate school at Duke University in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina, and the Ritz-Carlton was in D.C. So after school, we get in the car, we drive up to D.C., and we arrive in the early evening at the Ritz-Carlton, and it's only valet parking. And at that time, I'll tell you, as a young college student, I didn't have a lot of experience with valet parking. I, I was uh, a little intimidated to pull into the valet parking, and immediately the valet attendants came out. Now, if you've ever been to the Ritz-Carlton, and I think they still do this to this day, they're dressed up, they have the hat, they have the tails, they have the tuxedo. The, the first um, attendant runs around to my side, opens up my car door, and then immediately goes around to the other side and opens up my wife's car door, and he says these words, whom are we welcoming to the Ritz-Carlton? My wife Kelly said, I'm Kelly Searcy, this is my husband Nelson, to which the first attendant immediately turned to the second attendant and said, Mr. and Mrs. Searcy from North Carolina have arrived. Now, let's just pause right there for a second. First of all, I sort of straightened up in the seat and thought, I have arrived. I mean, I have arrived. I've, I've arrived at the Ritz-Carlton and they're welcoming me. My second thought was, how does he know we're from North Carolina? 
Well, it seems that as he left my car door to go behind the car to open up Kelly's door, he glanced at the license plate and then made an assumption to his friend who was at the computer that Mr. and Mrs. Searcy must be from North Carolina. Well, he was right in that case. We were in graduate school at North Carolina. While he was helping us out of the car and with our luggage, his colleague was pulling up our name and pulling up our room number so that we could be ready to go straight to our rooms and get checked in. And of course, we're wowed. We get our keys and we make our way to our room and we're wowed by our room. We're wowed by our experience from North Carolina, but we were also hungry. Or at the Ritz-Carlton, rather, we're wowed by this Ritz-Carlton experience, but we were also hungry. So we sort of put our stuff down and headed back out to have dinner. Well, as we walked back by the front of the hotel, the same person who welcomed us said, Mr. and Mrs. Searcy, enjoy your dinner. We went and had dinner. We came back. Same person was still working at the front area, said, Mr. and Mrs. Searcy, welcome back. Well, by this point, I, I'm so intrigued. I, I've got to have a conversation with this guy. How, how in the world can they remember our names and, and treat us the way they're treating us? And so I, I talked to the valet and he says, we're trained at the Ritz-Carlton to call people by name the second time that we see them. So I've been rehearsing your name since I first welcomed you earlier this evening. And so now every time I see you, I want to be able to welcome you by name. And we have a practice here to welcome people by name the second time forward. I may have to ask you a second time, but from there on out, I want to know your name. I said, well, how often are you reminded of this? He said, every shift we're reminded to call guests by name. And I said, what, what do you mean every shift? He said, well, before my shift starts and all of the employees start their shift, we have a pre-shift meeting where we go through the Ritz-Carlton credo. <laughs> I said, okay, what's the Ritz-Carlton credo? He says, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And then after we go over the credo, we go through these very specific instructions, these values that we have, these practices like calling guests by name, like giving you the best night's day that you could possibly have. And he listed off several others that you can find books and articles about the Ritz-Carlton and Discover. I'm just amazed by this. We, we leave this, and before we head up to our room, we notice there's a restroom in the lobby. So we decided to take advantage of that. My wife goes into her restroom. I go into mine. When we come back out, we both have this amazement on our face. Because in her restroom, at the, at the sink, they had a lot of nice lotions and a lot of nice soaps and even some mints. Now, in my restroom, they didn't have necessarily the nice lotions and the soaps, but I didn't care. They had these great mints. And so we both walk out with this mouthful of these mints, and we're saying, there were mints in our restroom. I and mean, we were so wowed by this. In fact, if you come to the journey today, you'll be offered a mint. If you go to any journey restroom, you'll find mints and mouthwash in the guy's restroom. And you'll find soaps and lotions and mints and things like that in the ladies' restroom. Because I thought the Ritz-Carlton got it right. In fact, by the time we were done with our weekend stay, we were amazed over and over. And I began to think about that. You know, they're in the good night's sleep business. I mean... Compared to the places that I normally stay, the Ritz-Carlton is in the same business. That is just to give you a good night's sleep, to give you a place to stay in a city that you don't have a home in. But the qualitative difference between some of the places I often stay and the Ritz-Carlton is tremendous. Well, I've tried to adopt that treated feeling at the journey. I want you to feel like you're special. I want you to have a good experience, even in the restrooms. I want our greeters to treat you with respect and give the impression that you have arrived. Yes, I know it's a little more felt than it is taught, but it is those little things, like what you have in the restroom, about how your greeters call people by name. I, I've never personally been all that great at remembering people's names. I've worked at it. I'm a lot better now than I used to be when I first went in ministry. But I have some people on my team, they can remember people from the first time that they meet. Well, we want that kind of culture. We want that kind of welcoming environment. We're not trying to be Ritz-Carlton. We're not in the sleep business. In fact, we're in something far more profound. We're in the eternity business. We're in the business of welcoming people into our church family. So think about how you can treat people with dignity and respect like they're welcome. And then the last area is how are they seated? How are they seated? This is simply literally giving them a seat, a seat in your worship auditorium or in your worship space or in your sanctuary. 
And uh, you want to have ushers who know how to seat, ushers who know how to invite people to slide to one side or another so that they can make their way in. And you know, since uh, the heart of our ministry is in New York City, the people who do this best are the people at the Broadway shows. And if you've ever been to a Broadway show in New York City or perhaps in your town, you know that these ushers really know what they're doing. They give you something to hold. They give you a program. And, you know, even, even large grown men, they somehow feel more comfortable if they're holding something in their hands. And I'm a big fan of using a program in your church or a bulletin, and I'll show you how to do that in future sessions. But you give people something to hold, and then you help them find their seat. And if your church is very crowded, you have particular ways and processes that you've developed to find a seat. But more than likely, people will be able to find a seat in your church, and then they sit down, and they're ready for our second focus area. But that's going to be in our next session. In this session, we've looked at the pre-service area, and I've given you four areas of first contact, four areas to think about in the pre-service area from the street to the seat. In the next session, we're going to pick up our couple, our first-time guest. They're in the sanctuary. What do we need to do now? But that's next time. See you then.